Well, welcome back. It is another Friday edition of our Bet US Boxing Show. You're not getting rid of us that easy. I am the somewhat capable host, TJ Reeves. He's the guy you're here to watch, see, and hear from for fight analysis. Our insider here on Bet US is Dan Rayfield. We're back aboard for another edition of the show. How are you feeling this week as we get ready for a large fight card deep in the heart of Texas in San Antonio? Dan, how are things? Well, as I see, TJ, it's not always about the quantity of fights. It's about the quality of fights. And I think this weekend, while we don't have a ton of action, we do have a quality card that we're going to talk about. Lots to get to. We've had a, a couple of announcements of upcoming fights, including the unified heavyweight championship fight between Alexander Usyk and Anthony Joshua, which is a rematch for August. That was announced during the week. Jake Paul is going to be back in the ring. That might come up here in a little bit. But we're more concerned on this show with previewing what's happening in the ring this weekend. We're glad that you found us uh, here on Friday. If you did so live, participate in the live chat, ask us some questions. Dan is always game for that, including about future fights or uh, other things. Uh, we may even get into some discussion about the Alamo. Dan has got a an axe to grind with the, uh, the whole setup of the Alamo. We'll get to that a little bit later on. But anyway, if you are live in the one Eastern time hour, uh, make it a point to participate and interact. If you're catching us later on, make sure you're here with us live on Fridays at 1 Eastern time as we give out the free gambling advice on BetUS for the fights. And if you've been paying attention, we didn't have as good a week last week. However, you did hit uh, with one of your KO props uh, last week. Uh, and, and got that successfully. But by and large, we've done very well by you, the viewer, by you, the, the, the gambler that's seeking our advice. Of course, as we joke, Dan, it's worth every penny they're paying for it on BetUS right now, our gambling advice. But you've done pretty well, Mighty One, with some of these picks. I have. I mean, I, I mean, not to toot my horn, but I don't know. There was a couple of years ago where somebody uh, on Twitter kept a running list of uh, like the you know 20 different media people's picks for the whole year. And I finished on top, amazingly. So I've done pretty well with my picks over the years. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. If I was wagering He's, in all these fights, I would definitely be ahead. Put it like you that. You would definitely be ahead. Oh, and, if, and if viewers have been paying attention on all of these, they would be doing well. And again, uh, we'll get into specific fights in just a second. Part of what we like to do, and you're going to see this in our predictions, is not only give you the who, but give you the how. And maybe if we feel really frisky with an over-under, uh, it may be the when on the fight, and you get better value, Dan, as we like to talk about, on getting a knockout prop correct, if you do, or an over-under prop. So not just who wins, but how they win and when they're going to win the fight. That plays into the advice that we're giving out just in general terms, right? Sure. I mean, you can play it, you can play it more uh, conservative, I suppose, and, and go with the money line on a fight and just pick the winner. But um, I'm conditioned over 20-plus years of covering boxing to not only pick the winner – but is it a decision? Is it a knockout? And frankly, because I've been asked a thousand times for my own outlets or by other outlets because they do all the media picks, you give them a round if you think it's going to be a knockout. So in my mind, anytime a fight comes up, I think about, is it going to be a knockout? Is it going to be a decision? Is it going to be a knockout in a certain round? So I'm, I'm conditioned for that. So rarely do you see me. And if people have been watching our first month or so of these shows, I don't, I don't pick the money line most of the time. I mean, occasionally it will happen. But, um, you know, I like... And I don't think it's aggressive. I like to make the pick on whether it's a KO or a decision. Sure. Uh, because I think that plays into the knowledge that I have about the types of styles that the fighters have and how they might match up. And, you know, I hit on, on a lot of them, to be honest. I mean, the key is to get the winner, obviously. But if you can get yes. the win, that's even better. Do you, do you want to be right? And do you want to be right frequently with the how? Because that pays off a little more. We're going to see that coming up. And I see some of you already in the chat. Uh, Kevin the Trucker is already <laughs> saying that. to us, I see him. He says, Dan, going to make me a rich man, is what he says right there. There it is. Uh, we'll see if that continues uh, here today. So that's the perfect segue. Let's get into the matchroom boxing fight card that no, will no be pressure. Saturday night. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. That no pressure. But uh, let's get right into it with the big main event that's coming. Matchroom boxing fight card Saturday night in San Antonio, Texas, deep in the heart of Texas, where Jesse Bam Rodriguez is the unbeaten local regional favorite here, defending his WBC Junior Featherweight Championship junior against a 
Junior yeah. Bantamweight, forgive me because I'm going to confuse myself on the weight classes. Junior Bantamweight division here on this to fight against a former world champion in uh, a, a Thailand fighter, uh, Sri Saket Sorung Visai is his name. Sorung Visai is a well-known veteran if you follow boxing. So this is a classic matchup, Dan Rayfield of the young, up-and-coming, unbeaten, brand-new champ against a veteran former champ. We see this all the time in boxing. Give me some thoughts to open up here. First of all, excellent matchup. As you mentioned, uh, Bam Rodriguez is a young champion. He is presently the youngest active world title holder in the sport of boxing. He's fighting in front of his hometown crowd. He is undefeated. And he's in a tough fight, man. Let me tell you, Srisiket Sarangvisai is no joke. I consider him a borderline Hall of Famer. Uh, he has two huge victories against Chocolatito Gonzalez at a time when Chocolatito was considered the pound-for-pound pound king of boxing. Sarang Visay is best known for his second title reign that started when he uh, scored the first controversial decision over Roman Gonzalez, but left no doubt in the immediate rematch when he knocked him out cold. But he's a two-time champion. He had won a title a few years earlier and lost it to a fighter named Carlos Quadras. Carlos Quadras, who do you who was that, you ask? Well, he is the man that was dethroned, or not dethroned because it was a vacant title, but beaten by Jesse Rodriguez in his re most recent fight. And so he's going from beating Quadras, now he's taking on Sarungvisai, a guy that had lost a technical decision uh, to him back in 2014. So it's been quite a while. That was a competitive fight until uh, a headbutt situation uh, short-circuited that fight. But Quadras and Sarangvisai, those who follow this closely, if, if, if not, I'll give you a little knowledge. They're two of the big four, like the four horsemen, like the four kings of the 115-pound weight class over the last several years. And that's Quadras, Sarangvisai, who's in the fight Saturday, along with Chocolatito Gonzalez, who's a guaranteed Hall of Famer, and also Juan Francisco Estrada, who's also a likely Hall of Famer. And those four guys, similar to the greats of the 80s, Duran and Leonard and Hagler and Hearns, They've fought each other multiple of times. They've been in great battles. It's been a, a tremendous round robin over the last several years. These guys mm -hmm. make exciting fights. And and Jesse Rodriguez, you know, he would, took the fight against Quadras on short notice. He was supposed to have the fight with Sarangvisai for the vacant title. Sarangvisai uh, became ill and had to withdraw from the fight. Bam Rodriguez, who was on that undercard, stepped up to the main event. And what did he do? He dropped Quadras. Uh, won a, a, a decision, won the, the vacant title, and now is making his first defense against Sarangvisai. So it's a really good matchup. It should be an exciting fight, and it's an interesting fight from the point of view of you know who wins and how. Because you know, do you like the youth and the aggressiveness and the speed and the and the confidence of a young kid like Bam Rodriguez who thinks he can't be beaten is on top of the world, or the real steady, excellent veteran? Uh, who's seen and done more and forgotten more boxing than Bam Rodriguez has ever known, who's still, even at his age, 34, and a southpaw, still kind of going strong. Well, and in the case of Jesse Rodriguez, who you talked to uh, last week in an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview, this is fascinating because a lot of this has come quickly for him. He is the youngest, this is correct, the youngest world champion in boxing right now, just barely turned 22 years of age, right, Bam Rodriguez? That is correct, and I'm going to take... Uh, take a little wind out of anybody anybody's sales who's in our age bracket he is the first <laughs> world champion in boxing don't say born, it don't I, say, I it. To say it i have to say it the first world at least i i can't speak for the women's side maybe i'm missing something but in terms of men's boxing champions mm -hmm. he's the first world champion born in the 2000s uh Makes yeah because he's, he's just turned 22 born in 2000 we are getting old because we, we go all the way back to like Sugar Ray Leonard. We go all the way back to Muhammad Ali in our well, eras, Larry Holmes, blah, blah, blah. Bam Rodriguez wasn't on the planet for any of that. What's he up? He was with that? born in the year that I started covering professional boxing as my job. <sighs> he so. was born in this century. Yeah. He was not in the last century. I do feel old. In any event, let's get into this and what we think is going to happen. So, Bam is a good puncher. Uh, Sorung Visai can take a punch. What do you and believe could, happens here? And and by the way, Sarangvi is a good puncher himself. I mean, just take a look at what he did to Chocolatito Gonzalez, who had been indestructible, and he didn't just knock him out or defeat him. He laid him out cold. And I was mm -hmm. at that fight in Carson, California, and it's an outdoor tennis stadium, and you could just hear a pin drop when he got knocked out because so much of the crowd there that night was rooting for Chocolatito Gonzalez. Um, this is a this is a tough tough fight. Um, but as I as I often would think about in boxing, 
um, if all things are equal, it's hard to pick against the youth and, and the exuberance and the attitude of a, of a Jesse Rodriguez who doesn't know how to lose, who has really not taken any wear and tear on his body. He's coming off an excellent victory against Quadras. And Sarang Visay has not been – I mean, he's winning and he's looking good, but he's not at the A-level top of his game the way he was a few years ago. He's getting older. He's got 50-plus fights, takes its toll. He's traveling to the United States to Bam's hometown. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's got some uh, that takes wear and tear. He's certainly capable of winning the fight. Don't make any mistake about it. He's a good puncher. He's vastly experienced. He's had uh, nothing given to him in this career. He is fearless, and he's got a good team behind him. All things equal, though, TJ, it's hard to pick against Bam Rodriguez. He's so young. He's so strong. He's so excited, and he's got a, a you know just something in terms of his mentality. Like I'm not getting beat. He's got a great corner in Robert Garcia uh, as his head trainer. Uh, it's it's really a tough combination. And uh, so all that said, I have to go with Bam Rodriguez by the decision. All right. Uh, interesting. A viewer was watching us and put the comment up there. Theo was watching us and said, hey, he's not losing Bam a decision. There it is. Uh, if they go to the scorecards, we know what's going to happen. You and I are of that same belief. I do not believe that this is going to be a Bam Rodriguez knockout. I think Sorung Visay is too tough, but I, like you, believe Rodriguez is ultimately better, will win more rounds. You and I are in concert here, Dan Rayfield. Let's lock it in. We both like Jesse Bam Rodriguez to defend his uh, junior Bantamweight World Championship by decision. It's paying right now on the Bet US line minus 140. We both like that. And we should say, too, to the audience, there is not a bet U.S. line on the over-under, but the implication would be from both of us, take the over. We it's, it's automatic. We obviously think this is a decision win, so take the over, whatever it is. You may see an over-under out there at like 9.5 or 10.5 rounds. It's not there on bet U.S. We're giving you more insight double, even though it's not locked in here on this fight as an official uh, play for that. Do you buy into the uh, the scorecard thing? You've seen this so many times in your career. Home crowd is behind him when he's landing punches. It influences the judges, et cetera, et cetera. How much of a factor do you believe that is, Dan, for, for Bam Rodriguez in his home area? I'll say this, uh, TJ. It can't hurt. I don't think the judges go out of their way to do that. I mean, they are humans. They can be susceptible to that, but they are trained to try to uh, tune that out, to ignore that. But again, they're human beings, so it does happen. Like you said, Bam is going to be the hometown crowd favorite. They're not fighting in a big arena. It's not like they're going to be in a huge stadium with you know tens of thousands of people going wild. The arena that they're fighting in is about a 3,000-seater. Uh, they expect it to be pretty filled up. Um, but if you're, if you're of the mindset that it's a Bam Rodriguez decision win, it's just another brick in that wall you're building on that pick that he's at home. And if it goes a distance... Uh, there's a pretty good chance that the judges will at least be a little more friendly towards him. you know. And when I say that, it's not as though the judges would be doing anything wrong, but if it's a close round, maybe they're going to give him the benefit of the doubt. That's just human nature. That's what happens. It's called hometown advantage. It's sort of the similar way that if you're an NBA team playing at home or you're an mm-hmm. NFL team playing at home, that you get that little extra something. The only sport where it doesn't matter is baseball, where where it's not about judging. You know, If you win, you get last licks if you're the home team. In the other sports, it's just something that is more mental, I think, than than practical in terms well, of the clearly uh, officials are human. They get affected. The referee in the ring might get affected, but a judge ringside, but no different than an NFL official, an NBA referee will get affected and an umpire in baseball by booing, by crowds booing and, and haranguing them. And we now have instant replay to review their calls if they well, get just- it wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just saying if Bam starts scoring, in this fight, the crowd will be behind him, and it human nature has to influence judges. Sorung Visai scores some combinations or some big punches. There might be an ooh or an ah, but it's not going to affect the judges from a crowd noise standpoint. You well, know that. That's the only when thing I'm, I'm making. When I'm making a pick of a bam by a decision, it, it's not in my thought process that it's because the judges at home are going to be helping him out. But if you're making that pick, and especially if you're actually wagering money on it, uh, that would be one factor of many when making the decision. That, like I said, it can't hurt. If the fight was in Thailand, we might be having a different conversation. The <laughs> fight is in San Antonio, yes. Texas, a few minutes from where the kid lives. Um, it, 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 when you're collecting all of the data and you're going to put your own hard-earned money down on a fight, that has to be one of many factors. And it, as I said, TJ, 
it can't hurt. Yes. Amen. On all of those. Um, one other thing here, I was thinking of this when uh, when you brought this up. You hit on the Dev- Devin Haney undisputed lightweight title win on the Bet US show back a couple of weeks ago, and he did have to go to the foreign land down under to Australia uh, and fight George Cambosis in his home country where Haney had never been and never fought before. Now, none of the judges were Australian, so there's not a bias th- there, but there's 40,000 people in the rugby stadium with the retractable roof that are cheering for anything Cambosis is trying to do. And Haney just completely silenced all of that and put on a dominant performance. Uh, but that's, and, that's and it, the difference. That's the difference. Yes. That was not a close fight. There was no way the judges, I mean, you never say never, I guess, but that was so blatantly obvious who was dominating that fight that it was impossible, it felt like, for anybody to do the scoring any other way. Um, on paper, I always felt like Devin Haney was going to win that fight pretty handily. This fight between Bam Rodriguez and Srisiket Sarangisai, it seems to be a closer matchup just because it's not like Rodriguez is an otherworldly defensive fighter or a phenomenal speed demon or has great punching power. You know, he does everything very well, but Sarangisai is no joke. There's a reason he's been around as long as he has and still going strong and been a two-time champion and has beaten Hall of Fame fighters and has been in uh, even fights where he's lost. He's been competitive. Like, for example, um, you know, when he lost to Estrada, that was a close fight. But the point is, this is not Bam, uh, this Bam Rodriguez against Sarangisai is a different ballgame compared to Haney going on the road against Cambosis. Where, remember, when we did that fight and picked it, and it was just, just not just on Bet US, Devin Haney, as the traveling American to Australia, was the betting favorite. In this case, Bam Rodriguez, the hometown guy who is the champion, obviously is the favorite. So that was a little bit unusual for Haney to be the favorite going on the road like that. But, you know, the odds proved out and he won the fight very handily. I think this one is a more competitive fight than what we saw in Australia. All right. Should be in that case. Again, it is on DAZN, the streaming service. It is the main event from Matchroom Boxing. So we're looking forward to that with Rodriguez, Bam Rodriguez, and Sorung Visai from Thailand in the main event. Earlier in the evening in the co-feature fight in San Antonio, this is a unified world championship fight for the IBF WBA Junior Featherweight Championships. Murajan Akhmadialev. Did I come close? TJ, you've been butchering this name all week. It's, it's <laughs> MJ Ak- Akhmadaliev. It ain't that Akhmadaliev. hard to say, my brother. It's not that hard. Akhmadaliev, the I mean, Uzbekistan have... champion. Yes. Usually I'm most concerned about when I'm writing stories, you got to make sure you spell it right. But Correct. now we have to say it right because we're talking on a, on a video or on a, on, a, on a live stream. People will presumably uh, see this. I MJ agree. Akhmadaliev. And MJ is the two-belt world champion here. Uh, at what 122 pounds and is a former uh, bronze medalist right in the Olympics unbeaten at 10 and 0 as a professional and has what three championship wins including winning the unified belts uh, recently in his last uh, two fights he won it and defended it once Uh, and here Ronnie Rios is a veteran from California a veteran American who's been in world championship contention in a world championship fight before all right so Dan tell me more about the matchup that is the co-feature here for uh, Saturday night in San Antonio. Uh, this is a mandatory fight. Ronnie Rios is the mandatory contender for one of those title belts. It's a fight that has been postponed previously, uh, like many fights we've seen in boxing because of COVID at one point. So now finally, uh, this fight is on, uh, taking place on this undercard of Rodriguez and uh, Sarang Visay. And, you know, again, it's an interesting matchup. It's a solid fight. It's a, a fight with a young champion in Akhmadaliev, who, like you said, is 10-0, uh, one uh, a medal in the Olympics. He lost in the Olympics to the eventual gold medalist, uh, Robisi Ramirez, who's coming off a spectacular knockout victory that we picked uh, properly last week on the Joe Smith uh, undercard, uh, Arthur Better be of Joe Smith undercard in New York City. But uh, Akhmadaliev is, uh, is an excellent champion. He's not the biggest name. You know, he doesn't have a huge fan following, at least not in this country. It's kind of under the radar to a degree. And to be under the radar like that as a unified champion, it's kind of tough in boxing. Um, because of the fact uh, that he just hasn't broken through, let's say, in uh, the United States. Ronnie Rios has been around. He's, he's with Golden Boy Promotions. He was a good United States amateur. He's been pro for a long time. Um, he's fought for world title in 2017 against Ray Vargas, who was at the time the reigning WBC champion in the 122-pound weight class. Loss of decision. Has another loss to Hovinicini and since then. But has put together a little string of victories. And he's been, like uh, we've talked about, uh, just a good, solid contender for 
quite a long time. He's earned this opportunity. The question is, can he get over the hump and finally win the title against a, you know, a really excellent fighter? Uh, again, not a guy who's well known, but a guy that's very, very good uh, in uh, in MJ Akhmadaliev. It's a, it's an interesting fight. I'm not sure how much action we're going to see in this fight. These guys aren't necessarily the types of guys that you see in in all out brawls, but but it's a it's a fight where you can kind of see both ends of of the coin in terms of how you're going to go in terms of betting. All right, so MJ got a win over Daniel Roman, as you were re- referencing, by split decision in uh, January 2020. He then defended by TKO over uh, Iwasa, a Japanese opponent. Um, that came in April of 2021. He basically took a year off. He then fought last uh, November and won by decision. So two of his last three fights have gone the distance. From a handicapping standpoint, Dan Rayfield, what do you sense is going to happen, and what about the how? 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 If NJ is going to win, how is he going to win? What's your pick? Well, he is 10-0 with seven knockouts. So you'd think, oh, he's got a 70% knockout percentage, which is pretty good, especially for a fighter in a smaller weight division. But then you have to look at the opponents that he's knocking out. I mean, he knocked out guys earlier in his career, uh, not necessarily the best name opponents. The best guys he's fought, he's generally gone the distance with, uh, including against Danny Roman. uh, who That was a fight where a lot of people thought that Danny Roman, who uh, was the reigning champion going into that fight, thought that he deserved to win. And he ended up being on the short end of that particular outcome. Uh, Ronnie Rios, as I mentioned, veteran, experienced, fought lots of good opponents, uh, scored the upset when he knocked out Diego De La Hoya uh, a few fights ago, who was the first cousin of Oscar De La Hoya, who was considered a top prospect. That was considered an upset. So Rios is capable of the upset. He's got the championship level experience. Uh, he has been stopped before, but it's one of those kind of fights. And, and I've, I like Ronnie Rios. He's been a good contender, as I've said, for quite a number of years. It just always has struck me as the kind of guy that does just enough to lose in the biggest spot. So I think he can be competitive in the fight. I think he can make it a you know a, um, a nail biter, let's say. But in the end, I just don't think he has enough to get over the hump against the undefeated young guy with that background and uh, confidence. That that to me, uh, I think he doesn't get knocked out this time. I think it does go all twelve rounds. But I think in the end, uh, MJ Akhmadov gets his hand raised and retains the title. Akhmadaev, uh, again, has got a lot riding on this for a potential undisputed fight, maybe, if it can be worked out as well. Bigger payday, et cetera. American Stephen Fulton has the other two belts at 122 pounds. Dan, we won't go too deep into this. We do this on our Big Fight Weekend coverage on the website and on that podcast. But here for the gambling show, we won't go too deep into all of the politics of the how and the why. But a Stephen Fulton undisputed fight would be kind of difficult to make because they're promoted by different promotional outlets. Still, MJ would probably want that fight. That's what's riding on a victory here to help, I I guess, bolster his case for an undisputed fight with Fulton, the Philadelphia fighter that has the other two belts. I mean, what's riding on it is his status as a champion, number one, and his earning power. Uh, the Fulton fight would certainly be attractive to him, I think, because he wants to be undisputed like every fighter does. Stephen Fulton has made no uh, secret about that when he won his fight uh, not that long, just a couple weeks ago, against Danny Roman, the guy that lost the titles to MJ in the first place, uh, that he wants to have that fight as part of his legacy before he moves up to the featherweight division. But as you mentioned, it's a hard fight to make. Uh, you know, I'm not going to BS that the listeners say, you know, the winner of this fight is going to go into the undisputed fight. It's, it's it's highly unlikely. And one of the reasons for that, besides just the difference in broadcasters and promotions, is that while us diehard boxing fans would love to see it, it's two of the be- it, the two best fighters in the weight class for all of the belts. I mean, that's a very attractive proposition. Uh, it's not the kind of fight that has mainstream attention. It wouldn't be huge TV numbers for any particular outlet or streaming numbers. It probably wouldn't generate gargantuan ticket sales. It's just a really good, you know, diehard type fighters fight. And so, you know, the boxers want to get paid. It's highly unlikely. So from MJ's point of view, I don't think he's thinking about that. He's thinking about Ronnie Rios. He wants to keep those title belts securely around his waist or over his shoulder or wherever he decides to carry them and uh, and take care of his business on uh, Saturday in San Antonio. But uh, for those of us on the outside of the ring who are observers, it is fun to talk about the possibility of that type of significant fight. All right. So let's lock it in. Let's get the predictions going here. Dan and I are in agreement on who wins, that MJ Akhmadialev will get the victory. You still have a problem saying the name, my man. And it is? Akhmadialev. 
Akhmadalyev. 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 Just do me a favor, uh, MJ. Call him yes. MJ for the rest of the show, okay? And MJ is plus 200 for you by decision, but I actually like him for the knockout. I was surprised that the knockout value is not better uh, there at minus 165. I guess the odds makers at BetUS and elsewhere, it's a similar line elsewhere, believe this is a likely knockout, even though Rios is a veteran. So I'm only I, I'm only getting a payout here, uh, having to lay a dollar sixty five to get a dollar. You're getting much better if this does go the dis, uh, the distance. BetUS again does not, as of as we release this show, does not have an over under on this fight. I've seen it in a, in a couple of other places at either nine and a half or ten and a half rounds. Obviously, the implication from you is take the over, correct, Dan, on uh, on MJ here. If I'm picking a decision, it means take the over. Unless somehow I miss right. it, there's an over-under of 13 rounds, which I don't think exists. <laughs> Probably not. But all right, no, so- in all seriousness, though, I mean, you know, like I said, MJ's got a lot of knockouts, but it's who are they against. Uh, right. And again, I know Rios is, has been stopped before, but uh, I, for whatever reason, I feel like he's hanging in this one. And uh, the, the punching power... Of, uh, of MJ is a little bit of a mirage in my mind based on who he's okay. been knocking out. I'm a little squirrely on the win as far as an over-under, so I would not. I just want the knockout uh, as it's coming along. And like last week, you took the the light heavyweight unified champion, Archer Better Bia, by knockout. Um, and again, we should explain this on the boxing show, and I know we've got some questions rolling in here. Get the questions in the live chat because you see the Q&A is about to be next here uh, in a moment. Uh, and by the way, you can also hit us by uh, help us by hitting the like and subscribe button, hitting the bell, share it out. More people are seeing it. I'm seeing a lot of people growing in the live chat right now as well. So uh, some questions that are coming here if you're seeing us live uh, from that. But in any event, um, I believe I know where I was going. Oh, that's where I was going. In terms of the Better BF knockout, Um, you like to pick a certain round, but as we give the advice to, it is much more difficult to get that right. So in other words, if you are picking an exact round and it's a 12 round fight, you really have only got a one in 12 chance on a knockout prop or a stoppage prop to get that right. Now, what they also do at a lot of sports books, you'll see this sometimes on bet us is they'll have a group of rounds, Dan, where it's like the first through the third, the fourth through the sixth. If you like that group of rounds where you at least enhance it to like a 25% chance of getting that right. In this case, I've got MJ by the KO and I don't want to worry about the round. I just want a knockout or a stoppage. So from a strategy standpoint on betting, that's all I'm looking at. My man Rayfield is only looking for the bell to end the 12th round. That's it. Once the decision here on this, on the, on the disagreement, but Again, for the knockout props, you got to be careful. It was interesting last week. We were talking about betting specific rounds. So you just went with the better be of the Russian light heavyweight champ by knockout. If you were going for a first round knockout, which he almost got, if you had played that prop, a first round knockout, it was playing like it was paying like plus twenty five hundred in the mm-hmm. first round, and the second round knockout prop on Bet US was plus eighteen hundred, paying eighteen to one to get the specific round, and then it slid down to like twelve hundred, and then beyond like the third round, it was much much less value on that. I just thought I would point that out. It's just much harder, Dan. Just give me one more follow-up comment to pick a specific round, and it, and and I, I don't think there's a lot of value there in doing that. No, I mean as far as betting, you're probably right. But in my uh, conditioning as a being a mm-hmm. boxing reporter for a long time is people always ask you the winner and and uh, and a round. So that's just sort of in your mind what you're conditioned to do. But the, when I when you pick the round, at least when I do anyway. I know that the chance of me actually hitting the exact round, which I have done here and there over the years, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, you're really sort of making that pick based on like the rough time of the fight that it's going to be. Is it going to be an early knockout? Is it going to go into the middle rounds? Is it going to be a much later round knockout? You know, in the case of this fight that we're talking about with MJ against Ronnie Rios, the the outcome, how it happens, I mean, I'm picking the decision. Could it be a knockout? Of course. The one thing I am, I feel very confident is that MJ does win the fight. So Mm -hmm. if I didn't want to choose knockout or decision, I absolutely would bet him on the money line. And in this case, on that money line, he is just to simply win minus 700. So obviously you're not getting as good a value as you are picking the how with the decision, if that's the case, but it would be the safer route to go. All right, question and answer time. And we're going to cover a couple of more things about this fight card in the question and answer. Let's fire away, shall we, with some of the peeps. 
Uh, let's see. Jonathan Nelson is watching us. Deontay Wilder, the former WBC heavyweight champion, the American out of Alabama. Last two fights is lost to Tyson Fury. There are questions about whether or not now that he's no longer the champ, would he come back? He's about to be 37 years of age. So Jonathan Nelson wants to know, will Wilder return to the ring? And if so, against whom? Wilder is hinting on social media today, Dan, that he expects to be back. I don't know when. What are you hearing about a possible win or a possible opponent if, and I still think it is a, an if, the bronze bobber is actually going to come back and fight again. Uh, I don't have any doubt in my mind that he's coming back to fight again. And I say that based on my own conversations with his trainer and his manager, who both are uh, very uh, uh, strongly in the in the viewpoint that he does fight again. Uh, you know, he took some time off. Look, he just, just fought this past fall, best in, in October, in a very, very hard physical grinding fight against Tyson Fury that took a lot out of him physically and took a lot out of him mentally. So the fact that he hasn't come back just yet, it really is not a non-factor in my mind because the top, top heavyweights or the top fighters in the, in, in the sport period, you know, oftentimes it's not, it's not unusual for them to take a year off. So I do suspect that he'll be back at the very end of this year, maybe at the very beginning of next year, but I, I don't have any doubt in my mind that he'll uh, be back in the ring at some point. Uh, who the the opponent will be, that remains to be seen. Uh, you know, in the PBC world that he fights under, there are heavyweights. They just announced a heavyweight fight between uh, a guy he's defeated twice in title fights, Luis King Kong Ortiz, and the former heavyweight title holder, Andy Ruiz Jr., who are going to meet uh, on Labor Day weekend. Is it is it conceivable that if Ruiz were to win that fight, that maybe he fights him at the end of the year? Not out of the question. A wilder Ruiz fight has been sort of talked about a little bit. But the point is, there'll be opponents out there for him. Uh, but I have no question that Wilder will be back. All right. Uh, I have an interesting one. We we said that the Anthony Joshua Alexander Usyk unified heavyweight title uh, bout will be coming up uh, now in August, officially announced for Saudi Arabia on August the 20th. And the line is out on BetUS. Does it surprise you, Dan Raphael, that the – the line that I am seeing here for that fight has Usyk favored minus 230, Anthony Joshua plus 190 on the opening bet U.S. line. So Joshua, the underdog, Usyk obviously won the first fight. That's why he has the belts by decision. You make anything of that early line now that they officially announced it? That that line sounds exactly right. And I wouldn't be surprised if, as you said, they just put that line out. The fight was just formally announced. They just started their press tour where they had a news conference this week in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which will be where the fight takes place. They have another press conference that will take place next week in London, which is Joshua's hometown. That line, I wouldn't be surprised as it stands now if it stays basically about the same all the way through the fight. I don't think that's the fact, unless something dramatic happens in the lead up in terms of the training camps or whatever. But if it's just a normal uh, business as usual till we get to the day of the fight, uh, I suspect that that line will stay very, very, you know, uh, similar throughout the buildup to this fight. There's a reason why Usyk is the favorite. He showed the skills and the mastery of Joshua in the first fight. Uh, the, 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 the one big change since the first fight is the fact that Joshua has overhauled his training camp. He's now being trained by Robert Garcia, who we mentioned earlier, is also the head trainer for Bam Rodriguez. And matter of fact, mm -hmm. part of Robert's contract and agreement with uh, Joshua to become his trainer was the ability to leave the camp for X number of days so he can go and be with his other champions. So he will, in fact, be in San Antonio with uh, Bam Rodriguez, whereas as the as the training camp wound down for Rodriguez, he was being trained, you know, hands on in the gym by Robert's son and Robert's father and other people that have been with them in their camp. But he's been making that game plan, talking to them on the phone, but he's going to be there. Uh, you know, in San Antonio, but obviously his biggest priority right now is getting uh, Anthony Joshua ready for this big heavyweight rematch. So that's one thing that has changed in the Joshua camp. Usyk, uh, it's business as usual. The one thing that's taken place outside the ring, of course, is why this fight was delayed from what was supposed to be uh, the June-July time frame was because for a while uh, Usyk was putting the fight off because he's from Ukraine and he was uh, in a territorial defense battalion because of what's happening with the war in Russia. Uh, but he he and his team made the decision they would be better served by going to training camp, making this fight, putting uh, you know his his background, his country, uh, you know front and center on the international sports stage where he can bring positive attention to the country, and also you know he does have a contractual obligation to Anthony Joshua. So in terms of the boxing, it's the change of the trainer for 
AJ in terms of what's happened in his home country uh, where he's got lots of friends and family. Uh, that's been a big factor in terms of the preparation thus far for Usyk. But he's a pro. He'll, he'll, he'll make sure that he's ready physically and mentally. So the odds don't surprise me at all. Usyk is the favorite. And I think he'll be the favorite until fight night. Unless, you know, in Britain, maybe it will be different because they have such passionate fans that like to put their money down on Joshua. But in terms of worldwide, uh, I think you're looking at Usyk staying as the uh, as the favorite for this one. And Usyk pretty much put on a boxing clinic in fight number one. Will it happen in fight number two? We don't know. The Garcia angle, as you mentioned, as the new trainer, how much tactically can he help? Make over, Joshua. That's what we're going to find out. All right, rapid fire with some more questions and answers before we have to get out of here. Lucas is watching us. Lucas White, he has a question on a fight in England, Saturday afternoon, U.S. time. These are junior middleweights. He wants to know about Sam Eggington uh, and Zizek. That is a junior middleweight non-title fight. Eggington is obviously a Brit. Uh, Eggington is obviously a fan favorite. He is minus 110 for the knockout. Lucas wants to know your opinion on possible Eggington knockout in England Saturday. Man, I love the ones that go deep into the uh, those types mm-hmm. of fights. But look, Eggington has been a very exciting fighter for a long time. Never really quite reached that world-class level. Probably best known for retiring Pauli Malignaggi uh, with a knockout victory a, a couple, a few years ago. Uh, fighting at home. You know, I mean, it's not the kind of fight I would be wagering on, but when I saw the number that came up, the minus 110 that he says is the number against Zizek, uh, I don't know if I say it's a steal, but it certainly seems like a reasonable pick. I mean, I would definitely pick Eggington in that fight, uh, whether it's that kind of knockout or not, uh, that that's hard to say. But uh, clearly he's the favorite, even if it's not by, according to this number, not a big margin. But, uh, you know, Eggington's one of those guys where sometimes he can rise to the occasion and sometimes he can, uh, you know, fall face first. It really depends. But this seems like the spot where he's he's the guy that takes this one. All right. F. Urka, if I have the name correctly, we'll get that uh, question up there as well. Wants to know your early thoughts. And this is a women's world title fight yes. on Clarissa Shields of the United States, Savannah Marshall of England world championship fight shields has been an undisputed champion in her division Uh, they also fought as amateurs previously as well just a little background so this fight is coming down the road a little bit early thoughts on marshall shields female fight well shields has been an undisputed champion both she's presently the undisputed champion in the junior middleweight division she has previously been the undisputed champion in the middleweight division before that she had been a unified champion in the super middleweight division so when she became the undisputed champion at middleweight she then decided to go down to junior middleweight she vacated one of those belts the wbo title savannah marshall then won that title so she's looking to become a two-time undisputed at middleweight and regain the belt that she gave up that allowed marshall to go and win that fight now you mentioned about the rivalry They've been talking more stuff back and forth than, than I've heard in a long time. They, they really are uh, not, not too uh, friendly with each other. Uh, as an amateur, Clarissa Shields won two gold medals for the United States in an amateur overall career in which she went 77-1. and one. Hello. And wouldn't you know it that the one loss happened to be uh, at a world amateur competition against Savannah Marshall several years ago. So that specter of that loss hanging over Shields and – and, and the great bragging rights that has given to Savannah Marshall has been the impetus for all of the constant trash talk between them and the inevitability of there being a professional rematch. It's been scheduled. There was interim fights. They confronted each other at one of the shows. Uh, it's gone back. It's gone back and forth. Now, remember, Clarissa also participates in MMA in the PFL, so she has to juggle her boxing schedule with her MMA schedule. But at long last, and what I broke uh, just a few days ago is that they will meet in September uh, in London at the O2 Arena. It hasn't been formally announced yet. But the, the, the thing with this fight is Clarissa is a master boxer. She's only got like, I think, two knockouts in her wins. Savannah Correct. is much more of a heavy puncher. But the skill set that, that Clarissa uh, has make her one of the best pound for pound women boxers in the world. I don't think most people hold Marshall in that high esteem. She doesn't have the kind of professional resume thus far that Shields has put together. So the fact that Clarissa is going on the road to do this fight does not give me cause for concern whatsoever um i just think she's the better fighter i mean we'll get i'm sure we'll get more into the mm-hmm. details when that fight comes closer and we it have gets to closer. Real fix but uh look here's the bottom line on that fight tj if you're a fan of women's boxing it is one of the two best fights that can be made in the sport we saw the first one a couple of weeks ago when uh katie taylor had that spectacular fight with amanda serrano and probably the next most wanted fight in women's boxing is clarissa shields against Savannah Marshall. So we got the one fight that we all wanted. 
We're going to get the second one, and only if men's boxing could be just as accommodating. Let's uh, let's hope that it is an exciting fight because you're right that the 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 verbiage, the trash talking has been heavy between Shields and Marshall. And I like that. You well, got to sell it a little bit. I'm going to say one uh, thing about that though: the more exciting that fight is, the worse it is for Clarissa Shields. She is the boxer. Savannah is the puncher. So she doesn't want it to be that exciting. She wants to box, move, box, move. I always say that when you're talking about a fight that is clearly matching the more aggressive, more entertaining, the more crowd-pleasing fighter with the more skillful tactician, it's always a case where the better the fight is for us on the outside of the ring, the worse it is for that tactician inside the ring. So Clarissa doesn't want this to be an exciting fight, no matter what she says. She wants to go in there and do her thing. Marshall wants high contact, high volume, and get those big punches in. Couple more moments. Again, thank you for all the participation on the live chat. I'll get another question or two to Dan in just a second. Again, chat is back. I love it. Yes, I know. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. We got more questions coming in just a second from the audience. I've got one more as well. Again, we're here Fridays live, 1 Eastern time. You may be seeing the show later on Friday. You may be seeing it Saturday before the big fight card in San Antonio. Jessica McCaskill, another American undisputed champion um, at welterweight. She's on this San Antonio fight card. Give me 30 seconds because that will be earlier in the evening before the Bam Rodriguez main event. Give me something on Jessica McCaskill out of Chicago. If Again, if you like ladies boxing, this is another prominent name to know. Go ahead. Oh, McCaskill is one of the best women's boxers in the world. I mean, she's right there in that pound for pound list in no particular order with Katie Taylor, with Amanda Serrano, with Savannah Marshall, with Clarissa Shields. Jessica is one of those women on that list as well. She's an excellent fighter. Uh, she had a couple losses, but she, you know, she was a, a late bloomer, let's call it, because she didn't come into the professional ranks uh, as a big-time amateur or anything like that. She's learned on the job, and she's done a hell of a job learning. Uh, she's best known for her big upset, two upsets, of uh, Cecilia Brekhus to become the undisputed champion in the welterweight division. Brekhus uh, is going to be in the Hall of Fame someday. She, for a long time, was number one pound for pound on the women's side of the sport. Just a just a phenomenal fighter for many years, and she dethroned her a couple of years ago. And now she's making a fight, a, a defense against, uh, remind me of the first name, Abara. I forget her first name, to be honest with you. Let me double um, check. Yes. But she, uh... she's, in a, she's in with a good contender, but not like an elite contender. So it's the kind of fight where, uh, I won't call it a showcase fight for him. She is Alma Ibarra. Yeah, right. Yes, Alma, Alma. Ibarra. A-L-M-A. A very solid women's contender in this division, but the kind of fight where uh, McCaskill did not have available to her the truly big fight, but you, you know, you're not going to just sit on your rear end and not fight. You still got to make a living, and there are still contractual obligations from a promoter. So they, they picked Ibarra, who was probably the best available fighter for her to fight, but uh, probably not the toughest night at the office for Jessica McCaskill. Just the speed and the skills probably going to be too much for Abara. But Abara, uh, who I have seen fight before, she will definitely go down swinging if she does, in fact, go down. So this will be on the undercard of Rodriguez and Sorung Visa, that DAZN matchroom card in San Antonio. Quick answers on both of these because I want to get to San Antonio and the Alamo before we get out of here. Uh, Theo, again, has been watching us in the live chat. He says, do you believe Spence Crawford happens this year? But if not, who or what are the other options quickly? Are they fighting? And if not, who would Spence potentially fight with three of the belts? Just real quick. Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford or bust this year. I don't think there's a plan B right now for either guy. The, okay. Look, it's been very quiet, and that's good because they're not negotiating this in the public, in the press, on Twitter. They are trying to make this fight, and I think they're going to get it done. And, and anybody that knows me, TJ, knows I'm Mr. Cynical when it comes to these right. things. Don't right. tell me about it till the, till the ink is dry on the contract. Uh, but if there's ever a time to have some hope beyond just the normal fantasy of, like, I hope this fight happens, I do think there's a very strong likelihood that they will make a deal and we'll see this big, huge mega fight probably in November. I was going to say, is the guess November? Because Crawford hasn't fought at all this year. So maybe November? That's the guess. Yeah, I mean, look, Crawford guess. fought at the end of last year uh, in uh, in late November when he defeated Sean Porter. He was then a free agent promotionally, so he's right now on the market. But this was the only obvious fight. Errol had the one fight earlier in the year where he was able to collect the third belt against or Dennis Ugas. And so now that's what's left. It's the three-belt champion Spence against the one-belt champion Crawford. Both of them are in the top three or four on the pound-for-pound pound list. And uh, it's time for them to take care of their business. And it's uh, one of the best and biggest fights you can make in the entire sport. And I can't wait for it. And I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, let's call it, TJ. I like that. And come cautiously. on. We'll see these yes. men in the ring together. And again, on the live chat, Kevin DeTrucker weighs in off the Better BF knockout. He looks like he's going to probably fight 
uh, English light heavyweight contender, former world title challenger, Anthony Yard. Kevin DeTrucker wanna know, wants to know, does Yard have even a 1% chance of beating the Russian better BF? Do you give him a 1% chance or negative Ghost Rider, he is not beating the Russian unified champ? I give him about a 10% chance, put it like that, which is still you give not You him as point. much as a, a 10% after what we saw better BF do to Joe Smith last yeah, week? Because, Woo. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying Yard's right. winning the fight. First of all, they got to finish the deal. It probably will get done. It's supposed to be in October in England. That's what both sides are saying. As much as we'd like to see better be up against Bevel, and as much as better be have told us, I was ringside for that fight against Joe Smith. He told us after the fight at ringside that he wants to fight Bevel next, but that is highly unlikely. Uh, but listen, Yard, you know, he gave a good account of himself when he fought against Sergey Kovalev. That was the one previous championship fight that he had. He fought in Kovalev's hometown in Russia and uh, gave it a very good go until he got stopped in, uh, I believe, the 11th round or maybe the 10th round of that fight. Uh, but he's a good puncher, and, you know, Better Biev has not necessarily got the, the best chin in the world. And so, you know, do I give him a chance? You know, I, I'm, I'm respectful of the power. Uh, so, you know, I think it's disrespectful to say 1%, but, you know, I'll mark it at about 10%. That seems fair. And the fight likely to be in England if and when it happens late this year, early next year, if that is the case. Let's circle back to the best bets. If you weren't with us at the beginning of the show, and again, we're live at 1 Eastern time, let's recap what we have. Pay particular attention to Mr. Rayfield because he has got Bam Rodriguez by decision, as do I. MJ to also win the Uzbekistan unbeaten unified champion um, at 122 pounds by decision, and therefore he's also taking the over. I like MJ by the knockout. I'm not getting as good of odds on uh, Bet US as you are, but I still like MJ by the knockout if that is the case. Before we are gone, you have spent a lot of time in San Antonio, and you and I joked on the Big Fight Weekend podcast. They can hear us elaborate on this point. You just want to say that in terms of the Alamo, remember the Alamo, and it's wor- and it's really famous uh, for San Antonio as we come back here. Um, that that the Alamo is uh, it's kind of interesting. And describe why, just real quick, here on San Antonio's Alamo. <laughs> well, as we were discussing on the podcast, I've always made it a point that when I go to fights, uh, you know, besides the main fights, I'm always in places like L.A., New York, and and uh, Las Vegas, where I've done all the tourist stuff. Mm-hmm. But when I go to a new city or a place I don't go very often, I, I try while well, I'm going to be there for a few days to do something that's local, that's cultural, that's not boxing related. And so if you go to a place like San Antonio, where I've been several times to cover fights over the years, one of the times I went there, you do what you're supposed to do when you go to San Antonio, besides have you know great Mexican food for dinner, and that's go to the Alamo. So I was there at a fight, uh, and I went with some of the guys that were also there covering the fight, and we took one of the guys' rental cars, and we drove out to the Alamo, which is sort of like in the you know on the main drag there. And you're thinking you're going to see this uh, very historic place where one of the great battles in American history took place that they uh, <laughs> sing songs about and write poetry right, about, right. And make movies about, and documentaries, and remember the Alamo and all that. And as we approached, I'm like, is that the Alamo? And I'm, I was just, I mean, if you live there, you know this or you, you've seen right. it, you know, but it was a shock to me because I had never been there. You just see the pictures and how cool it looks. And then you realize it's basically off the main street, like just on a sidewalk, essentially, or, you know, set back a little ways next to a gas station. <laughs> What? It's because, the Alamo. It's next to a gas Because station. you might need to most, fuel up uh, it was next the to the most Alamo. the bizarre thing I can ever yeah. remember seeing in the terms of like a tourist attraction or a famous thing. I mean, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. If you go to yep. downtown Washington, D.C. to the mall area and you look at the, the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial or the Capitol Building or the White House, I mean, these are sprawling places and nice parks, right. beautiful areas and great for, you know, gatherings and for tourists. You go to the Alamo, it's like in a strip mall, practically. You're saying that when we roll up to the Washington Monument, uh, free plug, there's not a pizza hut next to it. So yeah, why, why is there a gas, no gas station, station next to my Alamo? I understand. There's no laundromat. There's no convenience store. It's, <laughs> it's in a beautiful area on the you know, right by the Potomac River. It's beautiful. But the Alamo, you know, you could hit the drive through go to the ATM, go get some gasoline, <laughs> pick up your dry cleaning, and then go hit the Alamo. It's the strangest thing I've ever uh. seen. So we were talking about that because, of course, Saturday's fight card with Bam Rodriguez and Sarissa Getz are rugby size taking place in the great city of uh, San Antonio. So my, we love San Antonio. We I was love the saying, Alamo. We love the River Walk. We love the the enchiladas with the green chili on them. And yes, but my, my, my knocking of the bizarre location of the Alamo in terms of 
the, what's around it is in no way, shape, or form a negative towards the wonderful city of San Antonio. We or, love those people. It's just I, it's I a actually little... will say this: San Antonio is probably one of my you know few favorite places in the whole country to go to fights in. It's a wonderful. Well, city. listen. Great. I, I have I have been there for the uh, for the college basketball final four on several occasions. Uh, the Riverwalk is fantastic. The downtown area is fantastic. The only thing you're pointing out is it kind of tempers down the historical perspective of the Alamo if we have a gas station next to it. Exactly. I don't disagree with that. It was very off putting. I'll put it like that. All right. I think with that we're good. Anything else for the weekend before we look forward to this matchroom boxing Saturday night? Fight card in San Antonio in the Alamo City. Anything uh, else, Dan? I'm still trying to overcome the situation with the Alamo, so I'm done. I think we are all good. Again, thank you to our friends at BetUS with Alejandro and Francisco, Danny, uh, Natalie, everybody helping out with the show. Thank you for finding us. More and more of you are finding us. We see that. We're live Fridays at 1 Eastern time. One more time, hit the like button, hit the bell. You see it right below us as we talk on YouTube. Share it out. You see it right there on the screen as well. More people will find us as the summer goes on. We're hanging out here on BetUS talking boxing Fridays at 1 Dan Rayfield, have a great weekend. We encourage the audience to read us on BigFightWeekend.com. The website, Big Fight Weekend Preview Podcast, uh, is up. The uh, Fight Freaks Unite Recap Podcast, you find all of that on Big Fight Weekend. But Fridays, we're all good here on BetUS. Dan, have a great weekend. Thank you, sir. You bet, TJ. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. We thank you for watching as well on BetUS.